Hi guys, today we will discuss Sufism, its myths and realities. And since we get most of our knowledge of Islam from Bollywood and Marxist historians, there are some gaps between what is myth and what is reality about Sufism. Uh, for a basic gist, you must remember that just because someone dances and sings does not mean they will not kill you. Let's discuss whether that is the case with Sufism. Now first, it's theological history. This part can be a little tedious and rigorous and boring, but we will get to more interesting facts. So learn about the theological aspect as well. The normal misconception about Sufism is that it is very much like the mystic way of the Indian sadhu and shows a peaceful path to a union with God or Allah. Nothing can be farther from the truth. In the Sufism of today and since the victory of the greatest Sufi, Al-Ghazli, over the Mutazalis in the, in the late 11th century, the separation between the creator and the created is so clear that anything else that to, that to convey anything else, that to say anything else about this is to invite a charge of blasphemy. And we will learn why. Whether Sufism began within Islam or Islam adopted it is not very clear because the Islamic expansion in the 7th and 8th century into the Sasanian and Turkic territories was so swift that Islam hardly had a chance of consolidation and a course of adaptation was probably the normal outcome. What we do know is that there was a huge churn within, the Isl within Islam against Arab conservatism in the form of the Mutazali movement. Another strand was the Taikiki strand that borrowed from the Sufism that emphasized immanence of divine. While Mutazalis laid stress on a synthesis between rationalism and revelation and refused to recognize the Hadith exegesis, the Taikikis and Sufis alternated between complete fusion with the divine and reflection of the divine within the human soul something akin to Advaita or Dvaita of Hinduism. However, it stopped short of the concept that is in Hinduism that one material unity with different kinds of manifestations. Mutazalis also did not recognize Quran as, uh, as, 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 cons as uh, what, what, how to put it, as symbiotic with Allah, as complementary of Allah, stating that the created cannot precede the creator. So for that reason. Both Mutazalis and Taikikis honored the role of free will. The high point of the rationalist school was 833 to 848 AD or CE. Whereas the high point of the Taikikis was Mansur Hallaj, who was executed in 922 CE for his procurement of Anal Haq, which meant I am the truth. Both the schools, more particularly the Mutazalis, asserted the principle of free will in gaining Allah's favor. The counter movement consisted of the Asharites who regarded Shariat as the word of Allah and commandments to be followed. However, the Hadith part of the Shariat was written in the face of challenge from the Mutazalis. Now, what is the Hadith part of the Shariat? Uh, Shariat is a trilogy consisting of the Quran Hadith and traditions of the Prophet and the Sirat Rasulallah, which is the biography of the Prophet. The compilation of the Shariat went well into the 10th century and the first instance of the Sirat being made public is from Al-Tabri around 900 CE, though he credited it to Ibn Ishaq of the 7th century. The compilation of Hadith was accelerated because of the Mutazali challenge and was on in 848 CE when the Caliph Al-Mutawakil ordered the Mutazali privileges withdrawn. The principle of Wahadat ul Wujud, uh, existential unity of God or God is reflected in all, that is the meaning of Wahadat Ul Wajud. That, that principle is similar in essence to Dvaita principle of Vedanta and this was propounded by the Sufis of the early era, later to be propounded in detail by Ibn Arabi, Ibn Arbi of Spain or Al-Andalus. However, the most definitive intervention was made in the 11th century by Al-Ghazli, uh, who had the favor of the Abbasid Empire. Uh, now Al-Ghazli died in 1111. 1111 CE. He firmly favored the Asharites. His treatise called Tahafute Falsafa or, called, or all, um, in English it's called Confusion of Philosophy or Incoherence of Philosophers. This put made to the principle of free will. He propounded the principle of ontologically broken time, ontologically broken time, metaphysically broken time, in which Allah is creating and destroying the universe every moment. Thus, Allah controls the smallest action and event in the universe. This was a complete antithesis of free will and inaugurated extreme determinism among the Muslims. 
he also put paid to the principle of wahadut wahadute wajud and favored wahadute shuhud or observed unity of god or there is one god without the oneness preached by the early sufis thus he placed a firm barrier between the creator and the created till the time of al ghazli sufis uh, as a tariqa were often considered to be uh, to belong to different sects after him this difference was sought to be obliterated until it vanished completely in the 12th century ibn rush or also known as avroz wrote a critique of al ghazli titled tahfut tahfut confusion of confusion for this impudence he was condemned by the spanish branch of the caliphate and he was condemned to be spat on by the believers in front of the grand mosque of cordoba at regular intervals the advent of sufi in india occurred against this background of a churn in the abbasid scholarly space with an emphatic victory for the ashrite ulema or clergy with help from the devotional sufis the intellectuals who believed in spiritually in spirituality were roundly defeated the believers who, people who believed in spirituality were roundly defeated the mantle was kept up in spain by the likes of ibn rush and ibn arabi for a while before ibn Taymiyyah came out firmly in support of the Sufi Al Ghazli in 13th century and all signs of free will and a separate sectarian identity for the Sufis were eliminated. Sufis were indeed considered to be a separate sect in the beginning of the Islamic history but they got subsumed later. Tariqat and Shariat were differently comprehended till the time of Al Ghazli after which Tariqat became totally subordinated to Shariat. Okay Anybody who has studied even a smattering of Shariat trilogy regimen would know that it is an exclusive supremacist creed with no space for the unbeliever. It also resulted in the obliteration of the Sufis as separate sects and they simply became religious orders within their respective fiqh mazhabs like Hanafi, Shafi'i and Maliki and Hanbali. These fully subordinated to the ulama. This is how someone like Rumi in 1272-1273 CE That's how Rumi could dare to be different in his tariqat from the shariat. This became rarer and rarer after Ibn Ibn Taymiyyah uh, who died in 1328 CE. Sufism was marked and distinguished by ihsan or seeing Allah. After Al Ghazali's intervention, ihsan was I H S A N. Ihsan was relegated in importance. Its its importance decreased to number 3. Iman or belief became paramount and deen or the religion and its observan- observances came next reason and rationality were banished completely and direct experience of divine was relegated to a subsidiary position now history of sufism in india advent of sufis in india was mixed after al ghazli their independent existence as independent sects had been obliterated they had to be a part of the mazhab in which they operated which in india's case was the hanfi mazhab The Chishtis accompanied the invading army of Muhammad of Ghur and set base in India. The line of Moinuddin Chishti, Nizamuddin Auliya and Baba Farid is the Chishtiya Tariqa that later got subdivided into many silsilas along Nizami and Sabri divisions. Surawardis had come to Sindh even earlier. Next was the turn of Kashmir where Said Mir Shah Hamdani or also known as Shah Hamdan a Kubra a Kubrawi wrought such untold misery for the kafirs that it resulted in the code of umar uh, which we have discussed in a, in a separate video that code of umar was now applied here and was instrumental in forced conversions and and the first exodus of hindus from kashmir the nurbakshi shia silsila of shamsuddin araki was even worse leading to the second exodus of hindus from kashmir There were still a handful of Sufis who continued to espouse the immanence of divine and kept treating the tariqat as different from shariat. Some Qadri Sufis were the main among them. Bulle Shah was the last of them. However, they were just exceptions and exceptions only prove the rule of intolerance of Sufis who had now fully subordinated themselves to the shariat. However, saints like Bulle Shah, Waris Shah and Sarmad were denounced as heretics by the ulama. Exactly in the manner that rakshan who was a devotee of krishna the definite turn towards full resolution of tariqat shariat became important to the ulama after akbar's drift away from the from hardline islam into dini illahi this effort was led by uh, by the mujaddid mujaddid alfisani sheikh ahmed sirhindi 
of the Naqshbandi Tariqa. The Naqshbandis are the only Tariqa that claims their descent from the first Caliph Abu Bakr. Unlike all other Sunni Tariqas, the Qadriya, the Surawardi, the Chishtiya, the Kubrawiya, including Ovesia, that claim their descent from the fourth Sunni Caliph uh, or the first Shia uh, Imam Ali ibn Abi Taleb. As soon as Jahangir ascended the throne, the charismatic Ahmed Shir Hindi, who claimed descent from the second Caliph, Hazrat Umar Farooq ibn al Khattab, prevailed upon him to move hard against unbelief and shirk. Guru Arjun Dev was the target of Sir Hindi. He was arrested and brought to Delhi in 1606 shortly after Jahangir took over and executed when he refused to convert to Islam. As a Faruqi hardliner, Hazrat Umar's descendant, his effort was to enforce the code of Umar in the Mughal Empire. The Mughal court politics between the uh, Muhaddis of the Mughal court would cause a brief setback to Sirindi when Jahangir put him into house arrest in 1619 in the Gwalior fort but released him under pressure from the Naqshbandis and due to some clever maneuverings from the Sheikh himself. So much so that before he died in 1624, he was rewarded twice and put in charge of educating the Mughal army. Not just that, his son Sheikh Muhammad Masoom got an exalted position first in the remaining three years of Jahangir and later in Shah Jahan's court till Dara Shuko became important. Dara was more under the influence of Qadris of Tariqat, uh, Qadris of Tariqat persuasion. Sheikh Masoom made him made his uh, son Saifuddin the mentor of Aurangzeb at his request. He was instrumental in inspiring Aurangzeb to launch the massive project of Fatwa Alamgiri with 500 scholars and countless support staff that would be completed long after his death. One of the main architects of this project, Shah Abdul Rahim, would also swear allegiance to the Mujaddidi Naqshbandis and his son Shah Waliullah, whom I have discussed in my video about uh, that movie, Bra Brahmastra. I have discussed uh, what Shah Waliullah's works are and his contributions are and why he is famous and infamous and how he was also inspired by Rumi by the way and his son Shah Waliullah. So one of the main architects of this project Shah Abdul Rahim would also swear allegiance to the Mujaddidi Naqshbandis and his son Shah Waliullah and grandson Shah Abdul Aziz would play such an oversized role that the entire Sufi pantheon would be colored in a pro or anti hue of their legacy. It was therefore not a surprise that the Mujaddidi Silsila of Naqshbandi Tariqa became the flavor of the season in the remaining period of the Mughal Empire. The Ulaya Naqshbandis drifted apart and as we would see would join the Barelvis while the Mujaddidi faction would influence the Deobandis. Shah Waliullah was terribly distressed by the decline of the Mughal Empire and ascent of the Marathas. He was the one who played traitor to India in the classic Darul Islam vs Darul Har binary and invited Ahmed Shah Abdali set up an alliance for him with Najibullah of Rohilkhand and the Shia Asafuddullah of uh, Awadh and triggered the 1761 Battle of Panipat. The gains of Panipat did not last long and Abdali had to go back, with Marathas chasing him and winning Delhi and uh, Najibabad back in 1771. Shah Abdul Aziz then declared India Darul Harb in 1803, alarmed by the power of the Marathas, the British and the Sikhs. So it was no, no, no longer Darul Islam. Shah Abdul Aziz had two principal lines of disciples. Sayyid Ahmed Barelvi with his disciple Shah Ismail Dehlawi, who was, who was uh, Abdul Aziz's grandson on the one side, and Maulana Fazal Haq, Khairabadi Chishti and Fazle Rasul Badawni on the other side. The former followed the Mujaddidi Naqshbandi's hardline Sufi ways and the latter followed the Prophet's divinity doctrine. The immediate cause of dispute was an 1826 book by Shah Ismail titled Taqwatul Iman in which he belittled the Prophet as just an insan e kamil or the perfect human being. He was opposed by the fazl e haq faction with a fatwa signed by 14 scholars denouncing the book and as is customary among various faction labeling Shah Ismail as a kafir. Sayyid Ahmed Barelvi and Shah Ismail died fighting a jihad against the Sikhs in Balakot, but that divide persisted. The fazl e haq faction insisted, insisted on the three attributes of the Prophet vis-a-vis -vis that he was the nur -e allah that he was Hazir-Nazir or ever-present, and that he had the ilm -e or knowledge of the things unseen. After 1857 revolts, 
Fazl e Haq was transported to Andamans and the followers of Shah Ismail founded the Deoband sect. Followers of the opposing sect comprised all other Sufi tariqas and even the other silsila of Naqshbandis or Ulaya. Under Ahmed Raza Barelvi, they would set up the Barelvi sect in 1904 in Bareilly. Today, both Deoband and Bareilly regard Deobandis and Barelvis regard Sufi tariqat as subordinate to Shariat. Not just that, there is no difference of opinion among them on Dawa and Jihad. The position is the same as that of Hanbalis and by extension, same as Al Qaeda and ISIS. This is what is taught in the madrasas and the Indian government tolerates it in the name of religious rights. The Barelvi sect is owed allegiance to by every Sufi tariqa and silsila except the Mujaddidi silsila of Naqshbandi tariqa who are the th- who are theologically much closer to Deobandi influenced as they are by Ahmed Shirhindi and Shah Ismail. All one needs to do is to have a look at the Nafrat ke ahkam also ordinances and commandments they are they are a list of those things. Now that Nafrat ke ahkam contained within the 30 volume magnum opus Fatwa e Razviya of its founder Sheikh Ahmed Raza Barelvi Qadri. Now behavioral behavioral history of Sufism. We saw what the Sufis did in the Kashmir Valley in the 14th and 15th century. We have also seen how Ahmed Shirhindi Shirhindi became instrumental in the killing of the fourth Sikh guru. The influence of these Sufis became all pervasive in Aurangzeb's time, whose bigotry will need a separate article by itself. We have also seen the activities of Shah Waliullah and his bigoted disciples, including by Sayyid Ahmed Barelvi, who was unique in the sense that he was an ulema, a Sufi, and a Ghazi, all rolled into one. The the 1857 revolt was turned into a jihad by Sufis. Fazl e Haq Khairabadi Chishti issued a fatwa of jihad from Delhi. The Sufi aspiration from the 1857 revolt was to re-establish the glory of the Mughal Empire by ousting the British. Except the Fazer movement of uh, it's called uh, I think it's a Farezi movement yeah. Except the Farezi movement of Bengal which was basically a Wahhabi whose leaders were Shariatullah Titumiya and Dhundumiya. In the 20th century, every other than this, every major massacre of Hindus had a Sufi subtext to it. The 1921 Mapilla rebellion and massacre were led by a Qadri Sufi, Abu Muslier. The 1946 Calcutta killings were led by able premier, uh, by the able premier, he was the chief minister Surawardi, and he belonged to the Surawardi Tariqa, Mr. Hussain Shahid Surawardi. The 1946 Noakhali massacres were initiated and led by Gulam Sarawar Husseini. a nazimi chishti and a member of the peer family of daira sharif in noakhali the 1947 massacres in northwest frontier province afghanistan of those days and the bordering jammu and kashmir areas of poonch and meerpur the massacres in these areas in 1947 were inspired by the qadri chief of manki sharif in noshera district aminul hasnat the conversion and abduction being done by the qadri peer mithumia of bharchundi sharif in in Sindh Pakistan are well known to all thus violence and fanaticism does not go away only because sufis like to sing and dance in full mil- in fulfillment of ihsan which is subordinate to iman and deen so in conclusion it needs just a few simple questions to any votary of sufi syncretism to demolish any claim of peaceful coexistence do sufis have an existence apart from their fiqh or mazhab do sufis not follow shariat Does tariqat or tasawuf or the Sufi way supersede shariat? Is there a single verse in the entire shariat trilogy of Quran, Hadith, and Sirat uh, that appreciates the dharmic way? Can a Sufi bless any unbeliever or a disbeliever? Since the answer to each of these questions uh, is an emphatic no, you have your answer. Now, as I had mentioned, the quote of Umar uh, a little behind in the video. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'd like to tell you what are exactly the points in the code of Umar that was applied in Kashmir. The Muslim ruler shall not allow fresh constructions of Hindu temples and shrines. No repairs to the existing Hindu temples and shrines shall be allowed. Hindus shall not use Muslim names. They shall not ride a harnessed horse. They shall not move about with arms. They shall not wear rings with diamonds. They shall not deal in or eat bacon. they shall not exhibit idolatrous images idolatrous images 
they shall not build houses in neighborhoods of his, of muslims they shall not dispose of their dead near muslim graveyards nor weep nor wail over their dead they shall not deal in or buy muslim slaves no muslim traveler shall be refused lodging in the hindu temples and shrines where he shall be treated as a guest for 3 days by non muslims no non muslim shall act as a spy in the muslim state no problem shall be created for those non muslims who on their own will show their readiness for islam non muslims shall honor muslims and shall leave their assembly whenever the muslims enter the premises the dress of non muslims shall be different from that of muslims to distinguish themselves